Still so busy, Maria? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I basically work seven days a week. I don't have weekends. Like, oh I my goodness. What day a week uh, it is. Huh. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. yeah. And you're home all the time then? Yeah, I, I don't go to any sites or meetings or anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So. Okay, Chris, I'm about to make you the host. Okay. And, and there's Janet. I, Janet Hi. has arrived, and I did okay. see Jack Jemsek in the attendees. Um, okay. So you can move him over if you, <clears throat> if you choose to. So. All right. But I'm about to click make Chris Breastrup the host. Okay. Okay. And then can you make um, Maria the co-host? Or do sure. I? Do um, I don't know if I can. I can't now because I'm oh, no longer okay. the host. I'll I'm make her co -host. Share There screen. she goes. You can do it. But okay. I think I can share screen as, as just a purchase panelist. So it's fun. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm making you co-host anyway, Maria, oh. because in case okay. something goes wrong, okay. I'm there to get us out of it. All right. <laughs> All right. And, and Chris, I have my phone. You can text me. Otherwise, I'm going to say, have a good meeting. All right. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Sam. Bye. Bye. All right. So are we recording? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's 504. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee Joint Meeting. Um, it's Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021. Um, Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL 30A18, this meeting of the Zoning Subcommittee and Planning Board is being conducted via remote participation. Um, and I will do a roll call. Uh, Janet McGowan. Oh, here. Doug Marshall. Present. Um, I'm present, Maria Chow. And I know Tom Long will be a half hour late. Um, so I guess we'll just make note of that. And then um, Andrew, Andy is not able to make it, I think. I already know that. Um, I can't remember who did meeting minutes last week or who volunteered to do the minutes. Andrew Does did it the first time. Yeah, I think it was Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we don't have minutes. That's all right. Um, any announcements, Chris? No announcements, although Janet wanted to talk about um, the bill 5250, and that would probably come under topics not okay. reasonably Got it. anticipated. Okay, all right. I'll try to end it a little early. And I also want to make sure we have time at the end for public comment because um, we have public comment at the beginning of agenda item number two. If anyone in the public has something to say that's not on the agenda, tonight um i'll look for hands and oh I, I think i've been doing this at every meeting uh the people who are present are maura pam rooney and jack jemsek and i see no hands so we'll go on to item three zoning priorities um a update on work on zoning priorities i imagine that's why rob you're here <laughs> maria yes uh, sorry, do do we need to actually appoint someone to do minutes this time? Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me. Um, any volunteers to take minutes? Uh, last week. Looks like first, it's up to Janet or me, you know. You're the only ones here. So um, you want to do rock, paper, scissors or? <laughs> I can do minutes. That's you can fine. do minutes? Thank you, Janet. Thank you. All right. That means I'll probably do next week. So how okay. do I make sure that I get a transcript? Is Do I have to do something here? myself um last time andy just emailed pam i think and pam was able to send it to him along with a video because he liked to watch it too to remember who said what so yeah. i would email pam do you think okay do we have to we don't have to do anything to get a transcript then oh it says live transcript is available okay. i'm do you see a live transcript across the bottom of your screen now yeah yeah, yeah it just it, like it just started yeah. Assign think, someone to type. What does that mean? Who do we? I do? don't know. But I think um, Pam knows how to access that file later on and distribute yeah. it to whoever okay. wants it. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Janet, for volunteering on the minutes. And thanks for the reminder, Doug. I completely forgot. 
Um, but all right, so update on work on zoning priorities. Uh, Chris or Rob, do you guys want to talk about what you've been talking about for the last week? <laughs> Why doesn't Rob do this uh, okay. update? He's really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. He's more organized uh, than I am. <laughs> all right. Hi, everyone. Um, so, you know, one, I guess, reasons why the last zoning subcommittee meeting was uh, postponed and, um, you know, as we were looking at the work plan that was previously developed and trying to figure out how, you know, how are we able to help the zoning subcommittee and ourselves try to accomplish these uh, tasks that uh, we've been asked to address, uh, some of them by the council, some of them are our own priorities. And uh, you, so we, we took a little time, uh, got a better understanding about where, uh, what we need and where we need to go in the next coming weeks and uh, started looking at a, a more uh, workable work plan uh, for all of us. And that's uh, going to be discussed uh, in uh, more detail tomorrow night at the joint CRC planning board meeting. But what we know now is that um, we have brought in all of the planning department staff to assist uh, on this and make that a priority and a commitment of theirs uh, to work along uh, with Chris and I on, on these items. Uh, so we've got the, uh, the few items that the council has asked us to address. Uh, you, you've already started working on some of those, the BL, and I, I see on the agenda you're talking about footnote M tonight. Uh, while you're, you know, working on those, staff is also addressing uh, or looking at different uh, concepts uh, for BL, looking at apartments, looking at um, uh, inclusionary zoning, mixed use standards. Um, we're hoping that we can bring uh, in the coming weeks uh, some uh, more detailed information and support documents for uh, everyone to, to start considering. Uh, and working with along with the work that you're doing. Uh, but I think at this point, you know, that's where we are is we're, <clears throat> we're setting ourselves up for a more realistic time frame. Uh, not so much the March 15th target <clears throat> to have these uh, amendments ready for consideration. It's going to be, you know, quite a bit after that. Uh, and, uh, you know, just so you know, uh, staff is committed to working uh, on this with you. Uh, as you uh, work on certain aspects of it. Chris, feel free to add anything to that. Um, well, we also have a couple of other things that we're working on like a, part, a definition of apartments. And I think um, Rob mentioned mixed use building standards. And along with all of this, we're still working on the recodification. And then we've got a couple of things on the back burner like flood maps and demolition delay. Mm -hmm. So, um, all of that is kind of moving forward at the same time, but we're trying to focus on a limited number of things. And those are the things that Rob mentioned, BL, footnote M, I think supplemental dwelling units is another one. And mixed use building standards are the ones that we're really um, you're putting the most of our focus on right now. So tonight um, you all are gonna talk about footnote M and we're going to um, chime in. And I think uh, different people have submitted documents since the last time you met. Um, Doug submitted something, Maria submitted something. I think mm -hmm. Janet had a, um, an outline that she might want to talk about and Pam Rooney had something that she submitted. So mm -hmm. I don't know how Maria wants to um, move ahead with this. And Maria, of course, submitted something. Yes, you did. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know how you want to um, talk about this, Maria. Well, I guess um, one thing just about the work plan and uh, should we not discuss work plan because tomorrow we're going to have a joint meeting with the CRC and really go into that. So should we just, you know, uh, have that discussion later and just dive into like footnote M? Is that what you? I think that, so. makes, sense? that yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree because I think having the whole board, uh, since we're missing some GSC members anyways, and we're going to talk about it all together, uh, makes sense to just get into that tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Janet, do you want to talk about this particular um, agenda item or the next one? Or... Actually, I wanted to talk about, just have a question quickly for Rob and Christine. So um, you're saying that Right now, the zoning subcommittee, we're working on the moving 
BL into footnote B and footnote M. And then, um, is, and then the planning department is focusing on the recut um, definition of apartments, inclusionary zoning, mixed use standards, and um, as well as just the huge amount of work you're doing in other areas. And then this is a really long list of zoning changes. So I wonder about like, as you're talking about individual ones, looking down the road at other ones and the effect that they could have on what you're working on. So, and then, you know, if there's any back and forth, but you know, like are, is the, so that's the first question. The second question would be, you know, are you working, is a planning department working on stuff that will come to us in a little while? Um, I guess that's a, I, I thought that would be the discussion for tomorrow because more members would be present. Um, I don't know, Chris, do you want to get into? Has uh, that been worked out or, I mean? Well, I could talk about that a little. I think some of the things that the town council has asked us to do, we're kind of putting on a back burner for now. And we're trying to focus on things that relate to the downtown and um, more housing. And, um, you know, that's why we're focusing on the BL. We're wanting to you know, get more housing in there. We're looking at footnote M. So we're trying to get more housing in there. Supplemental dwelling units is another opportunity to get more housing. Mixed use building standards is obviously something that we've been struggling with for a long time. Mm -hmm. So things like um, putting footnote A onto lot coverage and building coverage, I think that's one of the things that we're kind of putting on the back burner for now. And, and some of the other things that the, um, that the town council asked us to do. So, uh, you know, you can't focus on everything at the same time. And, um, the zoning subcommittee had an opportunity to discuss the BL zoning district at your last meeting, I think, or maybe that was your first meeting. I can't remember. Um, the last meeting was canceled, I guess. Is that right? I think we've had two. We've had two. Anyway, one of those meetings was BL. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the second one was, but this one is footnote M. And so we're, we're thinking that it makes sense to bring um, things to you sort of one at a time and not overwhelm you by having you discuss all of these things at the same meeting. And um, the, the staff is working on these things in the background and doing a lot of research and trying to create some of the same kind of maps that Maria and Doug have already created to uh, understand what the impacts of some of these um, zoning amendments are. So. Um, so is that, I think that's an answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's great. And I think I'm really excited about the planning department really putting this as a charge for them to work on. So um, yeah, well, why don't we just get into footnote M because um, I feel like we're gonna have this discussion tomorrow and more in depth and with more people who are uh, making the decision. So it makes sense to just go into the next item. Um, so Janet, is that your hand raised still from the, First oh, I'm thing. sorry. It's, it's still right. I just, I think, oh. I guess for me, it's, I understand why we're going one by one. I'm trying to lower this hand. Um, but I also think the lot coverage one, you know, sort of supersizes so many things. And so I think, you know, that's always in the back of my head that, you know, it's the most comprehensive change to the town and whatever we're working on, you know, if it's a mixed use building or an apartment building or, you know, something in the BL, if the lot coverage is really up for grabs or can really extend to the setbacks and they're waivable, we're really talking about like a supersizing thing. And so I will bring that issue up as we talk about it. But I mean, but if, you know, if we made all these changes and all of a sudden this huge change came in, I would, I would feel remiss that we hadn't caught that earlier. So that's, that's, but I can talk more about that tomorrow. So. Okay. Um, so item B footnote M, Doug, you can share screen not as a host right you can i think you can yeah so do you want to talk about your charts you showed because i think that actually sets up what i my work yeah actually, so sure sure oh so sorry we're, we're moved on to item b discussion about removing footnote m section six table three zoning bylaw so that's what doug's gonna show right okay so i trust you can see a screen mm -hmm. with a bunch of pink and green on it? Yes. 
So may, may I just inject this uh, for a minute? Maybe someone should describe what footnote M is so oh, people who are sure. out there in the audience will understand what we're doing. Uh, yeah, I can do that or Chris, I'm sure you can do it much better, but uh, I can literally read it. <laughs> yeah, why don't you do that, Maria? Okay. So right now, <clears throat> footnote M is on table three dimensional regulations under RG um, for a basic minimum lot area and additional lot area per family. Um, there's a little footnote M under RG, the column for dimensional regulations that says basically um, in addition to the areas for this table, in addition to the areas required by this table for any existing dwelling units on the lot, the density for new townhouses and apartments shall not exceed one dwelling unit per 4,000 square feet of the remaining lot area, or in the case where there are no existing dwelling units, 4,000 square feet for each new dwelling unit beyond the first unit. So right now under RG, for the first lot, it's 12,000 square feet required for the first unit, and then additional lot area per family is 2,500 per square feet. But if you're a townhouse or an apartment, as footnote M says, you need 4,000 for each additional unit, or um, if there are no units, 4,000. So we're trying to see what impact removing footnote M will have. And um, I hope that made sense um, because what that means is basically you can have smaller lots that are allowed to have townhouses and apartments. And Doug and I did a study on what that means for the RG. Um, did I explain it? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. You, Maria, can you say that in smaller lots that what? What was that? You said that it allows smaller lots to have apartments and townhouses? It allows, yes, because the requirement, if we remove footnote M, you no longer need 16,000, for example, to have a two unit townhouse. You only need 14,400. Um, is that the math? Right? Yeah. So, you know, basically it reduces the amount of square footage for required for the lot to have um, units for townhouses and apartments. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Doug, take it away. All right. So um, what I did was uh, I started with Chris's 2016 memo and uh, that, that talked about some of the generic lot sizes. So kind of based on that, uh, I came up, I, I did this as a mathematical study. Um, so I took four sort of examples of lot sizes and that's here along the uh, left-hand column, A, B, C, and D. Uh, lot A is 9,500 square feet, B is 14,500. C is 21,000 and D is 50,000. Um, so to get any residential development on a lot, you've got to have the 12,000 square feet minimum that Maria just mentioned. So obviously uh, lot A is not developable. You, you can't even put a single unit on a lot unless there's already one that's pre-existing non-conforming. Uh, with lot B, you, you uh, devote the first 12,000 square feet to the first dwelling unit. That leaves 2,500 for, for additional dwelling units. And with, uh, without footnote M, uh, well, with footnote M, where you need 4,000 square feet for each additional dwelling unit, um, actually, I guess I'm saying that there's one, oh yeah, you, you can't have any more because you don't have another 4,000 square feet. Unless, may I just interject that if it's a duplex, you could have another one. It's only if it's a townhouse or an apartment that you can't have another one. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. So um, I guess that might get into the definition of a duplex versus a two unit apartment building. <laughs> but uh, we can leave that for another time. So, um, 
so in so on a fourteen thousand five hundred square foot lot, you would not be allowed to have any additional units beyond the first one, if it were an apartment or a townhouse, and so you'd end up with a total of one unit on that parcel. Now, if footnote M, which wants you to use 4,000 square feet for each additional dwelling unit uh, were eliminated, then it would go back to the numbers that are in uh, table three, which is 2,500 square feet for each additional dwelling unit. So in that instance, this lot size B, you would be allowed one more dwelling unit from that 2,500 balance remaining and then you'd have a total of two. And then lot size three is 21,000. Same, the same math works straight through. So 12,000 goes to the first dwelling unit, 9,000 remains for the additional ones. And in this instance, you know, you could, you could have two additional units because the 4,000 would go into 9,000 twice with a little left over. And you'd have a balance of three or if we eliminated footnote M, you could fit three additional units, which would result in a total of four. And likewise, if the parcel were 50,000 square feet, which is about a little over an acre, um, you know, you could have a total of about 10 units under footnote M or 16 without footnote M. So, down here under the notes, I've just repeated some of the other constraints on apartments and townhouses that are in the in the code or in the in the you know the regulations. Um, you know, in all cases, uh, apartments and townhouses in District RG would require a special permit. So that is a pretty high uh, bear or a threshold to require, you know, right out of the gate. In addition, uh, they're only allowed to be permitted by special permit in these three conditions here, where you where you're close to a heavily traveled street, you're close to business, commercial, or educational, or you're within an area already developed for multifamily use. So. Um, you know, I think that's going to start to prompt a conversation, uh, you know, maybe about what does, what does heavily, what does close mean? Um, is it within 25 feet or is it within a quarter of a mile? Um, so, and Maria will have a little more to say about that later. Um, then we've still got the definition of apartments that limits them to be between three and 24 units. And uh, if you are building an, an apartment building in the RG, uh, for every floor you, uh, you create, including your first floor, uh, the nominal setbacks in table three need to be increased by two feet uh, per floor for the side and rear dimensions. And then finally, uh, we are, you know, we, we limit apartment building unit mixes uh, so that no more than half of the units are of any one type. So, um, you know, that was, that was the analysis in terms of numbers for sort of prototypical lot sizes. <clears throat> could could so, I so, Oh, I'm sorry. So the second thing I did was to go back to what is to, to the RG and start to look at, um, well, what have we actually got here uh, in terms of, of lots in the RG district, uh, since the lot size has so much to do with how many units you could build. So the pink is units that are under 12,000 square feet, and the blue is units that have frontage less than the minimum 100 feet uh, that are required in table three. And uh, I will say that 
there is some overlap. Uh, so there, so for instance, you know, there might be a, a some some uh, green colored lots that are also lacking the one hundred the uh, lot area. But you know, I thought this was relatively instructive um, to show how many lots in this area are, are basically pre-existing non-conforming. Um, you know, there really couldn't be any development on them without consolidation of lots um, because we just don't have a big enough lot or we don't have the uh, frontage that's required. Uh, I thought it was kind of interesting to see that uh, up here in the northern end of Cottage Street, you know, all these lots have 100 feet of frontage. Um, so they must have been done around the time or shortly after uh, this, this particular requirement for 100 feet of frontage came into existence. Uh, that's also true of some of the other lots here and in, in there in town. Um, I was intrigued that, you know, these four lots here, um, you know, this one on the, on the left was configured so that it has 100 feet of frontage along uh, Fearing Street there. And that's why there's this uh, jagged property line between the two halves of what was originally one lot. And similarly, the same thing happened over here. The reason that lot, uh, let me just zoom it in here. The reason that is not a straight line is to, to give you 100 feet of frontage along here. So it's clear that the regulations have affected how the town was laid out and how people continue to subdivide uh, lots. So at that point, I guess I'll stop and turn it back over to Maria. Yeah, thanks, Doug. I, I learned a lot from that study. Um, I, Jack, do you have something to ask about Doug's, what Doug just presented? Is that what you're, um, do you want to speak, Jack? Yeah. Hello? Yes, um, oh, I was just wondering about the, the division uh, there in terms of the, the area. Um, you know, well, the, the, you had. The, you had those, those parcels, those four parcels that I signal, singled out, um, they were all large enough. They were all over 12,000 square feet. So that was not a problem. Yeah, I was just, I was just thinking of, of uh, um, like a quarter acre, um, you know, some round number, but I guess, I guess I need some background in terms of, of those numbers in terms of what we're dealing with with regard to lot sizes in Amherst? I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, well, if we go back to your table, um, you had like a 9,000, I mean, some of those lots seem too small to, to even be, um, there you go. That 9,500, that, 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 that seems, not, uh, I'm, not, I'm wondering where that came from and it, it just seems like it's. Well, uh, well, I guess the 9,500 really represents every parcel that's colored pink on this map. Okay. Wow, I, I, okay. It's... You know, because every, every parcel that's colored pink is less than 12,000 square feet in area. Huh. Okay. So if there's no, if so, you know, if there's an existing house on that parcel now, it can stay. But if there's no house on that parcel now, there can never be a parcel, a house on that parcel. <laughs> okay. And yeah, footnote, it, and foot, footnote M won't change that. Hmm. So let me, I'm just thinking a quarter, quarter acre as being like a, a threshold 
just from my experience. So that would be more closer to the, what's your other 12,000? 12, 12, yeah, I, well, I jumped up to 14. Oh, 1450, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is, yeah, that's, that's a little more than a quarter acre. Yeah. So I'm just, in my mind, I just have a you know, quarter acre is kind of like for, for a single home is kind of like the, the minimal amount, uh -huh. but I didn't realize there were smaller lots with an Amherst. Oh that, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, I didn't do this, but pretty much all of these parcels have a house on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and we're not, I mean, I guess maybe Rob or Chris can talk, you know, I'm not aware of any uh, endangerment of public health and safety by having houses on lots that are smaller than 12,000 square feet. Mm. Okay, thanks for the question, Jack. Uh, Janet, you have a question for Doug? Yeah, so I was going back to your chart with the pink and green. So if did could you pull up or make another chart with lots that are you know, 45,000 square feet or 50,000 square feet, like, would that be something that you could color in? Because then we'd have an, a sense of um, how many lots could have like 16 unit apartments. Um, oh, that's, that's my study. So I'll okay. Be so, okay, so then, okay, then my next question is going back to your first chart. Um, any of those lots that have a house on it could have a supplemental dwelling unit or a supplemental apartment. And my question, for, so that, so any house could be, have at least two units on it to start with. And my question for Chris is, could any of those houses also be turned into a triplex or fourplex? Could it, you know, either by, I, I've been kind of meandering through the subdivision, subdividable house or the converted house or, you know, all the different ways. And I know that in the RG, you can go up to a fourplex. So, so if well, we're looking at like trying to get more units on a lot, um, there are other ways to do it. So I was hoping to have your chart maybe also consider that, you know, you could have more units without entering well, into the realm of footnote M. Well, you are still limited by the allowable lot coverage and the setbacks. So, but if you had a big house on a small lot, that could be a three family or four family from what I'm reading on the code. But am I, am I missing something, Chris? Or if I had a big barn, you know, on a, you know, that, that could be converted into a fourplex. So I, am I missing this or am I getting this incorrect? May I answer that? Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. So, um, yes, you can convert a, um, a larger house into multiple dwelling units. And I think you can go up to six dwelling units in the RG zoning district. Um, you can only add one dwelling unit um, if you don't have the correct lot size. In a converted dwelling, you're allowed to um, get a modification of the lot size for the addition of one dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. So you can't have that modification for any more than that. Um, and yes, you can build supplemental apartments. Um, you need a special permit to do that. You need a special permit for converted dwellings as well. Um, supplemental apartments do not require the additional lot area per dwelling unit. Supplemental apartments have a limitation, which is that um, they need to be owner occupied. So depending on your point of view, that is either a good thing or it is a, mm, it's a limitation. So a, a developer would find that to be a limitation because he would presumably not want to live there, but a homeowner would presumably think that was a good thing and could have a rental unit or a unit for um, a family member on the property without having the additional lot area. Supplemental dwelling units are limited in size. Currently they're limited to 800 square feet or 900 square feet if they're um, fully handicapped accessible. 
does, so when if I was going to convert a larger house into six dwelling units in RG, does it have to be owner occupied, or is there any other restriction other than three hundred square three hundred fifty square feet foot per unit in terms of? I believe, and Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that for a converted dwelling, it has to be owner occupied, um, and you could go up to six units with a special permit if you if you were um, if you had enough lot area. In other words, you'd need the extra lot area per dwelling unit mm -hmm. to go beyond one additional unit. So put no M is useful in that way because you would only need a 12, 2,500 2, per unit. But if you were to do a converted dwelling. Converted dwelling would require 2,500. Oh, um, it's the same, oh. Per, per dwelling because it's not an apartment and it's not a um, uh -huh. not a townhouse. <coughs> okay, so okay that so so that that if you could do it with the so that you know four three four five or six dwelling units is not considered an apartment. It's just a converted. If you do it under the converted dwelling section of the bylaw. Okay. So when you apply for something, you have to choose or we choose for you which section of the bylaw you're applying under. And so there's no requirement that the dwelling units be different sizes or anything like that. So, okay, no. so but I think- Rob that... Mora has his hand up. Maybe we wanna hear what he has oh, to say. Yeah, maybe he's gonna say that I'm full of water or full of hot <laughs> air or something. <laughs> yeah, Rob, please speak. Do I need to unmute you or? Yeah, so uh, to answer uh, Rob's question, the maximum number of units in the RG on the converted dwelling uh, provision is four. Four. Uh, okay. And the other question about owner occupancy, they, it does not have to have owner occupancy. Uh, the, the converted uh, dwelling standards does allow a resident manager to exist in place of an owner occupancy uh, requirement. Uh, there's some other criteria that have to be met for the board to the zoning. This would be the zoning board of appeals that would be issuing the special permit uh, to find in order for the owner occupancy requirement not to be applied. Uh, has to do with location to heavily traveled streets or uh, educational areas. Uh, there's a couple other criteria, and if they find that, then it doesn't necessarily have to have that uh, condition. So, if you had a house that was on a small lot that was big enough to convert to four units, is there a minimum lot? You know, could you say, no, you don't have enough lot, you know, your lot isn't big enough? Because that's, right. that's, that's right. So the, the, for the four units, you would need the minimum 12,000 square feet plus 2,500 for each additional unit. So this okay. isn't a footnote M matter under converted dwelling section, but you do need that additional, uh, lot area. So 19,500. So that kind of leads, I, I think I see why you're asking this, Janet. You're trying to find out, can you still not get rid of footnote M, but still have more multifamily? And it's up to four units, basically. If you want to do townhouses and apartments, you need a pretty sizable lot if yeah. we put it down. Um, and I can show where that would impact because it's not too many places, actually. Um, that was a good study to do. Doug and I talked, I forget when, but um, we kind of talked about uh, what Doug touched on where, you know, where are the main arteries of downtown? Um, where are those heavily trafficked areas? And what I did was just, I just used the entire RG. I didn't say, um, well, let me just, it'll be easier if I just show this. So okay. Me, um, okay, thank you. Can I, hey, Maria, can I ask one question while, uh, while you're bringing that up. Um, mostly a question maybe for Rob. Have you had people that built a large dwelling on a lot, you know, maxed out the buildable area for a single family house on a lot, and then came back five years later and converted it to a multiple dwelling structure? No, that, that doesn't generally happen uh, by the definition of the converted dwelling. That structure needed to exist for at least 10 years, the, the principal oh. structure. So we, oh. you know, we haven't seen that yet that I'm aware of. Okay, so there's a 10 year 
rule of thumb about that. Yes. Great. Um, can you guys see the diagram? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Um, so uh, the arteries that sort of uh, the main heavily traffic corridors Doug and I talked about were this is a uh, Amity and Main. Um, yeah. Main, Main Street and Amity. Yeah, Main Street and Amity. This is Route Nine. Um, and this is North Pleasant, or 116 North Pleasant, East Pleasant, you know, kind of changes name as you go north. And then this is Triangle here. So those are the sort of what we just selected as, all right, those are the heavily trafficked areas. And then the next criteria is um, if it's near already a lot of areas that have a lot of multi-family units already like developed in that way. And so I, first I, I drew the arteries and then this sort of purplish gray thing is a one mile radius from the center of town. Um, so you can see it's all pretty walkable. Um, these are the three unit parcels in town. These are three unit parcels plus the four to eight unit parcels. These are the, uh, what I just said, as well as, sorry? I'm sorry, I don't, I couldn't find your little hand. Okay, I'll, I'll start back. Okay, so these are the three unit parcels. The ones that are in this sort of cyan color, those are all the three unit parcels in the RG. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, this is the RG. I hope that's clear, the sort of beige area. Okay. Um, these are the three to eight unit parcels in the RG. These are the three to eight and more unit parcels in RG. And then this is all of the non-owner occupied parcels. So, you know, I'm not saying they're all rentals or all condos. I don't know exactly their criteria, but it just means that um, these are either, you know, eight or more units per parcel, or they are probably rentals because they're not owner occupied. And um, based on all of this, I then took uh, Doug's study where he, you know, he showed the uh, 9, 14, 20, and 30,000 square foot parcels and what that meant as far as once you remove footnote M, how, what is the impact? It seemed like the only impact, you know, the first two square footage is you only added one unit per parcel. But by the time you got to 30,000 to 50,000, that's when the numbers really jumped. And so what I use as my criteria was all the parcels over 30,000 square feet and along these orange colored arteries. Um, so we'll start here with Amity and Maine. The big red dots are the properties that are 30,000 square feet and up. Um, I added some letters just because those parcels are larger than 30,000, but you know, it's a historic uh, project there. There's um, the church, this is the Emily Dickinson, that's the women's health, uh, a women, uh, women's club. These are over 30,000. This one's a little far back, but um, it's got frontage. And then this is a historic inn and that's a church. So along with Amity and Maine, these are the parcels that have over 30,000 that um, I kind of considered close, these are close-ish. The ones that are smaller dots um, just mean they're further away from these corridors. That's the only difference in the size dots. So if we look at Route 9, there's only a couple that aren't Amherst College owned that are over 30,000. And then along here, that's all Amherst College, this is Amherst College. And then there's pretty much nothing. Um, this is the only area that's in RG. There's not much um, directly on this corridor. I guess you could count this um, because it's in an area that's already got a lot of multi-family units or it's not over occupied. Um, Along this corridor, there these were all under thirty thousand. Um, there you get some up here that are over thirty thousand, and so um, and then these are uh, they're over thirty thousand, but they're you know, I guess you can consider they're close to a lot of multifamily and you're an artery. So as far as Doug's chart, um, I, I don't think I can get to it, but what happened with the numbers? Um, maybe I can get to it. Or let me stop sharing. And maybe Doug, you can pull it up again if that's possible. Um, once you got over thirty thousand, your units didn't double, but they weren't like you know you just added one or two units. It would go from um, ah, let's see, move the screen. It would go from like 
Yeah, from 10 to 16, you know, at 50,000. And then at 30,000, I could do the math and wrote it down somewhere, but there's no way I'm going to be able right now but it you know it was a sizable jump so anything below twenty thousand, or well, actually anything below 30 i didn't even bother with because it seemed like if you remove it um you're gaining one unit once you go to the 30 to fifty thousand threshold um that's when there's impact and if if um if you remember okay maybe <laughs> sorry if you stop sharing i'll go back to my my diagram that shows the red dots um oops wrong button I turned on my printer um there it is share uh you can see it's a handful of lots it's not a huge impact um maybe chris and rob you you know something else i'm not seeing but i just i don't see too many lots that aren't already you know this one's already these two are already um I forget what they're called, but they already, you know, developed with multifamily apartments and units. And so there's only a few that would potentially be impacted. And as Doug said, they would need a special permit. They would need to, you know, go through a pretty big process. And um, it's not an easy task. So um, Rhea, I guess. I'm sorry. But, so the little, the little red dots, are they, what are those? Those are over 30,000 square feet, but they're smaller just because they're not as close to the heavily trafficked areas. And they, you know, they're a little more set back, but they are adjacent to other multifamily parcels. And so that was one of the criteria is like either it's heavily trafficked or it's near areas that are already highly developed. So um, that's why they're smaller. And but some, of, some of these are already developed for multifamily. Yeah. Yep. You know, yeah. or in, or even like the one, one of the ones in North along uh, East Pleasant. There, uh, I think that's already mm -hmm. an Amherst Housing Trust property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's not a huge number of un, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, unrealized parcels that could potentially be impacted by footnote M being removed. Um, Chris and Rob, do you see something? I'm not seeing as far as like the the sort of beginnings of why footnote m being removed was brought up as like why this might be something that could bring more housing i mean i i guess you potentially are seeing maybe a dozen or so that um so this is a, a sro project but um you know there are, this it's not as big a impact especially coupled with doug's chart about you know it's not just adding one or two units if you want to add five or six units by removing footnote M. Um, it's uh, it's maybe, what is that, 15 lots? So I guess you could say, if I may say this, um, that yeah. it would allow some units to be developed that wouldn't ordinarily be allowed to be developed. It's not gonna be a huge um, influx okay. of new units, but that's probably a good thing because we're not gonna be flooded with you know, tons of new units. So depending, again, depending on your point of view, mm -hmm. um, we need new housing. Yes. Maybe we don't want, you know, a lot of big developments, but it's good to know that there are parcels that are available to be developed. And, you know, we, we need all the housing we can get really um, without going beyond our master plan, without developing in our hinterlands and our farm fields and our forests and those outlying areas we want to develop in places that are already developed so if we can find places that are suitable for development then that's a good thing they're already near services they're on sewer lines and water lines they're on streets that are already there you don't have to build a subdivision so the fact that there aren't a huge number of these things i think is probably a good thing because what, it's going to scare people too much. What right. is the number? I mean, so so that looked like 20, 40,000. I mean, so they looked like there were 20 or 30 of these 30,000 square feet or more. But there's, so could we quantify that? And then also, Maria, can you do an analysis of all the lots over 30,000 square feet? And, you know, the little, the smaller ones and the bigger ones. And, you know, because I think, you know, when we talk about 
um, you know, I, I don't, that doesn't look like a handful to me. I think of a handful as like three or four, or maybe six, but we're talking about 20 places that could go up to the maximum. And then as those places develop and as the town adds more and more multiple houses, that opens up more lots that are, you know, the more multifamily housing you have, which we're trying to encourage, mm -hmm. and the lots on the, you know, whatever the interior neighborhoods open up. So I think it's probably good to say how many, you know, all the lots there are 30,000, all the lots that are bigger everywhere, because at some point they could be developed. And I think, you know, would we be changing the nature of the RG by having all these apartments and 10 houses built in? I mean, I think you would have to take the long view, but I, this doesn't look like a handful to me, but I know that, it, you know, 30 years from now, you know, it's, it, you know, those other lots will, you, you know, hit the criteria, which is- oh, So you're, you're coming at from the other side. You think it's too many that would be impacted, whereas Chris well, is saying- I don't think it's a handful what you're describing, but I'm just wondering- 20 could you, lots. Could you show all the, of them were already could, developed. Could you show all the lots that are 30,000 or, or up? And then we can just we can just start counting them, you know. And yeah, start. it's it's, a, it's 22, but a lot of them were already developed. Um, I guess I could have shown which ones were already, you know, had been developed. So that 22 subtract out. Um, I can already see from my perspective, three of them are already, you know, that's four four or five of them actually. So it's probably like 15 lots that are over 30,000 that don't already have like, you know, multiple apartment complexes. So they, they're maxed out or? Oh, I don't know if they are. I, I haven't, you know, like one of them is um, Aspen Heights. Um, they're further out, you know, toward Belchertown. Um, so I guess- um, I'm just trying to get the data. Cause I, you know, it's like, you know what's the possible build out um, and then, by the way, I think there's somebody raising their hand in the audience, but, but, mm -hmm. um, but so I, you know, my question is like, what's the build out 10, 20, 30 years from now? Um, and then the other question I have, which is, um, you know, so I, I would like to see what this all could look like. And then if somebody combines a lot, you can make a $30,000, 30,000 square foot lot or a 50 by putting two lots together. And then that could be another you know, dense apartment complex or townhouse. And nobody talked about that scenario. And um, it just seems like for a developer to purchase that amount of square footage and then go through a special permit and then develop, you know, put the money in to develop however many townhouses and apartments, it just seems like such a hypothetical situation that's not likely I mean, we can talk about, you know, all the situations that are possible, but I think the idea is that um, if we remove footnote M for 90% of the scenarios, is this, what is the impact? Is it detrimental to our town? And I, I, I like this idea of having this, I keep saying this, we have this toolbox of various types of housing. And um, I like that point that Chris made how, you know, it may not look like a big impact, but all the different types of additional housing we can bring to Amherst is all in the right track. And so, right, Jenna, I think we do need to understand the impacts more. And so obviously this would be something that'd be good to continue studying. Um, but initially it seems like any small lots, it's not worthwhile. Anything large, it, it is. And then what we need to do is think through um, what current lots over 30,000 are not already maxed out and what that might look like. So those could be good next steps as far as studies. Yeah, um, I think it would be helpful. The other thing is, if we go back to um, Doug's first chart, I think I missed writing something down, but I have a question for Chris and, and Rob. So if we take footnote M off of um, the additional lot area family requirement, what is still what is left there is footnote A, and footnote A will allow a board to reduce the additional um, requirement of 2,500 square feet to something smaller, right? Because footnote A is very flexible, and it you know. So is that am I reading that correctly? Because the footnote A will still be there, so it's not like if we take footnote M away, it's not like it has to be 2,500 square feet per additional unit. It Rob, do you want to answer that? Sounds like you're yeah, that, that's, that's correct, Janet. It would, it would, um, it could be modified by footnote A. 
So the, 20, then, the 2,500, but the 4,000 cannot currently. Yes. And so if we looked at Doug's chart, we could, we could say, okay, if the, the additional lots was pushed down to 1,500 or 1,000, then the multiply, there's a multiplication effect there. And we can't predict what boards would be doing in the future. I mean, if you pulled footnote, footnote A off also, it would at least have some threshold, like you know, there'd be some bottom to that or top to that or whatever, how you wanna look at that. But Doug, can you put your chart up again? Cause I, I, I've completely um, forgotten what the maximum would be for. So 16 units, so. I just be... added, I just added this line while we were talking. So there's what 30,000 would be. Oh, you only gained three. Oh, I should yeah. have been higher threshold then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, overall I view this potential change as a very modest Mm. Uh, reduction mm. in the multiple obstacles or thresholds that a developer would need to overcome to end up with an actual project that people could live in. So, and then the dwelling units could be like one, two, three, four bedrooms kind of thing. So you can't, okay. Um, well, and you know, based on what we know about the market, I suspect 50% would be one bedroom and one 50% would be two bedroom because, you know, yeah. There, yeah. The, there's not uh, sufficient or the, the maximum demand is for the smaller unit. Well, yeah, for now. So um, Rob, Rob Marr wants to say something. Maybe we should. Yeah, please, Rob, can you enlighten us? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think um, this was a few minutes ago. I wanted to, I wanted to make a point about a smaller parcel um, because I don't think this idea is really targeted to get the 16 unit apartment building. Um, uh, with, with the building coverage limit and the lot coverage limit, the parking requirement, it's really not gonna work out well unless a, a large number of parcels are combined uh, for that to happen. And, and I, you know, we've, we've sat with developers to try to you know, look at that option it never works out. And I don't think this is gonna make a big enough change. But I think it's interesting for an investor that owns a two family on a 22,000 square foot lot, okay? Because under, with footnote M, they're limited to just that, um, the, the additional unit. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have an existing duplex on a, on a 22,000 square foot lot. Now that adding that one unit, um, maybe Maria will know this, but maybe I don't know if anyone else will, that's a trigger for sprinkler systems, you know, for a building. So when we talk to the, the typical investor of these smaller buildings, that generally discourages that, that conversation right from the beginning. But if we remove footnote M, now that two unit building could be turned into five units with 22,000 square feet. So now it's a little bit more interesting financially for an investor to look at that option. So I think, you know, I, and, I, and I understand the 30,000 square foot, uh, you know, you pick that number to start with, but there might be even, you know, a, a more meaningful impact to adding units in a little smaller size lot down to 22,000 square feet. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I had not considered the parking being the thing that was the deal breaker for the larger lots. So that's really interesting. And I mean, I think that's a really useful incremental growth that can happen that we need in our town. I mean, I'm all about that sort of infill of housing where we can. And so that, that yeah, that's great. That's great to know. Well, that, that starts to beg the question, you know, most of this RG district is within walking distance yeah. of, you know, the primary employer in town and the downtown commercial district. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether the existing parking might be relaxed to allow more people who could just live in town and work in town without having a car. Mm -hmm. Can I, I, I agree, Doug. Can I ask a question and I guess, Maybe you guys discussed this before I arrived, sorry I was late. Um, 
what what is the what is the let's call it the worst case scenario fear that we have here of removing this right because if you know janet's saying you know there might be 20 slots um maria's saying maybe 15 even if there were 10 that people actually decided to build out and they maxed out those 10 lots with housing what is the what do we see as the problem like what is the worst case scenario that we're trying to avoid when we do that, I guess so. I'm just trying to get a sense of whether this is an aesthetic issue, a um, an economic issue, a landscape issue. I, I just want to know more about what the concern is. Well, I think, I think Christine has said that footnote M was put on after Spruce Ridge and maybe Tan Brook were built, and so on. Basically, a one acre lot, a little bit more than one acre, you could have 16 units with multiple bedrooms. In a, in a when you go around the RG. You know that's that's a that's a lot of density in that neighborhood, and apparently the neighbors were unhappy. And footnote M was put on by town meeting, and so, well, so I think I think that the question is is having 16 units. They could be two, three bedrooms, one bedroom studios. You know, at least 16 people living in it, maybe 32 or 42 on a one acre throughout the RG. Is that and you know is that it? Is that something that people you want to see? Is that something that the neighborhoods want to see? Is it going to impact the RG, which is, you know, as we know, you know, not apartment housing primarily and not town housing? Um, so, I, you know, that's that's a question. There are people in the audience that might want to weigh in. There's a couple of hands up there, but I think that that's the question: is that it, there's a limitation on it. If you take off footnote M, we're talking at least 16 units. If footnote A is applied, we might be talking 30 units on just about an acre. That's is that the RG? Will that change the, the character, the historic nature? The will it affect the neighborhood quality? Um, you know, well, if it's all undergrads, we know that would be probably problematic and things like that. Well, I guess you know that saying the statement that Spruce Ridge, uh, forget the part that Spruce Ridge. Uh, it's kind of like the same argument about the downtown building saying like everyone hates them. It's not the case. It's not the case that everyone thinks that that project was bad. So I feel like it, that's a hard question to answer, Tom, because it's not black and white. It, it, I, I, I think some mm. people like the buildings and some people don't, and we can't say which is right yeah. or wrong. So, right. But is it, is it going to open up opportunities for more affordable housing by having a, a bigger housing stock within walking distance of downtown? You know, yeah. those are, I don't know about the impact. So, you know, I think those are questions we want to ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think the zoning subcommittee has had a good discussion about this. I'll open it up to some attendees so that mm -hmm. we can... Um, Make sure. Uh, so Jack, you've already spoken. Is that right? I'm going to let Pam Rooney allow to talk. There we go. Oh, so Pam, can you unmute? I am unmuted. Okay. So I, I if you just keep it to three minutes or less, so we can oh, um, make sure okay. we get. I mean, this is this is. Uh, I I had hoped a little bit more informal conversation than a public hearing. So I, but I did want to say. Um, thanks to Rob for bringing up the fact that it really is at, at about 22,000 square feet where you get the opportunity to put on four additional uh, units uh, to a property so that um, if Doug, and those are really great graphics, by the way, of um, <clears throat> the really small parcels, which kind of, you know, if we could do an overlay of the really small parcels that are, that are essentially under under 12,000 square feet or, or actually um, 19,000 square feet, that would sort of, we could set those aside and say, there's probably not much uh, ever any issue with having those get developed as apartments or townhouses. Um, I'm, a, I'm a strong supporter of increment or small infill, um, I think the New England style of house is that of sort of the build on, build on. And as long as it is in context and, and is meeting the square footage needs of, of the properties, I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, it would be really helpful though to see um, all of the properties that are greater than 22,000 square feet um, 
just so we have a sense of really the total numbers. Now, if, if anything over 22,000 square feet already has a multifamily house on it, that's good. That sort of takes it off the table too for future development. So we're really left with a subset of those that are single or duplex now in, in on lots that are greater than um, 22,000 square feet. So if something is a little over that, I mean, so uh, a half acre lot obviously could put, um, you know, five, five dwelling units on it. And I think that to answer Tom's concern, um, I think it's really the context where the RG is already fairly dense, um, meaning we've got, you know, 80 feet from, from property line to property line. Sometimes it's down to 60. That's very comfortable. I don't think anybody complains about that. Um, in fact, we love it. I think it's where you have an intrusion of a, a parcel that um, can put on the number of units that we're talking about is, is where it's a concern. Um, I, I needed to echo also, I think it was Janet's comment about uh, footnote A that has, um, you know, been requested to apply footnote A to lot coverage across all all zoning districts. That's kind of a that's kind of a concern for sure. Um, and let's see. Oh, as far as parking, um, I would say that. Um, I, we're still in Western Mass. That's all I'm going to say is yes, we can walk to the to the town center. Yes, we can walk to the post office, but unfortunately, we still need a car to go grocery shopping. And so, as much as we would really like to eliminate the cars in town, um, I think that's probably still something that we're going to have to deal with for a while. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. All right, Kathy. Um, Hi, I'm, I'm unmuting. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to build on what Pam said to avoid repeating, starting with parking. Um, I don't know how many of you have driven around these streets, but a lot of them don't have sidewalks, so there's no place to safely walk, so people walk in the streets. If you, people, unless you say you cannot have a car, if people start parking in the streets, the streets, which are already narrow, will get narrower. Amity has a problem now, and Lincoln certainly has a problem. The neighbors came to talk about parking on both sides all day long, sometimes through the night. So you can't go grocery stopping very easily. A lot of the people who live there already are elderly. So I, I think we can't just imagine a world without cars. I visit a couple people on the street these streets, and it's really useful that they have a driveway because my car then doesn't have to be on the street. So I, I think it would be also good, I love the maps and what you've done, if you could post them, to indicate which of these little side streets that have houses on them do or don't have sidewalks. Um, one of the things I think is odd about our zoning code when I look at it is that the word almost is either never mentioned or rarely mentioned. And when I'm looking in other places, they talk about a concept of insufficient street, that there are houses, but there are no sidewalks and it's a narrow street. So if we want more density and we want people to be walking, we've got to allow them to be able to do it safely. So I, just a few of these diagrams adding whether the streets have or do not have a sidewalk would be a useful additional uh, piece of information. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Let's see, Jack. Yeah, I was just, I wanted to go back to the, the figure and with the, oh boy. The dots the, or the red and green? The red and green, yes. And I just, I, I know the AC were, I think Amherst College, there's one other um, annotation there that I didn't understand. If you could oh, throw sorry. that back the right there. The that, was, that was yours, Maria. You had, oh, the, okay. le you had the letters. There you go. Okay. Um, so H means historic. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I missed on the H, that was all. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. I, I'm I'm really easy. Okay. 
<laughs> are, Jack, and that's why. I Thank you. It. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Other two have already spoken. So, I guess after we talk at their joint meeting tomorrow night about the work plan ahead, we'll know more about where we push these studies and how how far and if the planning department will help us um, focus on certain other areas or more on these areas or oh sorry um, so um yeah I, I, I it's really great having you here too rob just inputting on you know like immediately like why certain square footages are not good and some are and so these, these are really great discussions having people who have the actual data and facts you know chime in right at the moment when we're sort of going around circles discussing these so that's, it's really great um I don't know if anyone else, let's see, I lost my agenda, but if anyone else has more to say about footnote M. So could, in terms of next steps, could we um, have the charts kind of more expanded for um, like with Doug's chart, adding in the other ways to add, add additional units? Like the- Yeah, I think, I mean, if we're, when we talk tomorrow about, you know, the focus and what we're working on, if we're, if the ZSC is tasked still to, you know, study footnote M and study the BL, um, I think, yeah, we've got a lot of good ideas from all the input tonight about like what next layers of data to look into. So I just, I don't want to be premature on saying, all right, next meeting, we're going to do this because um, I think tomorrow is going to be a good discussion about the work ahead. So is there, is there so I, I think it's, I think the thing is, is that, you know, um, I feel like I'm on a multi-year getting to know the zoning bylaw, and I'm a little afraid of what Ben is going to do. I have to kind of relearn it. But as I see the many, many different ways to add units to um, houses and lots in Amherst is that, you know, it's a pretty generous town, a progressive town in terms of letting people add on to their houses. But And it's a pretty complicated group of ways of doing it. And, you know, at some point it would sort of like, let's simplify this. But I think that if we're going to go to the CRC or the town council, you know, it's, you could sort of say, oh, you know, this footnote M does this, but actually I feel like they have to understand the range of options. And so they might just say, you know, a fourplex sounds fantastic, you know, or that's enough. 16 sounds like too many. Or if, if footnote A applies, to the additional things we're talking 32 units you know that could be 64 people on a slightly more you know and so i feel like if we don't present that information and the complexity of it or the number of lots that are 30,000 or 22,000 or more it's like people won't really see it is because we're not zoning for this year we're not zoning for you know studio apartments we're not zoning for students we're zoning for amherst for decades you know it could be the next 50 years and so you know what's I actually think we should know what our build out is right now and what it could be as time goes on. And so those, you know, you could do that. And in fact, UMass has done that for us for our, you know, our projected build out under current zoning. But I, I think I don't want to pull back. I, I think, we, you know, these charts are super useful because it's so you get to look exactly what is there. And, you know, when Doug's saying, you can say, oh, 16 units, that sounds like a lot. That sounds fine to me bring it to the neighbors, bring it to the town and people discuss it. That's what, that's the public process that people want. And I think the town councilors are gonna want that. The other question I have is, is it possible that these things that we're talking about, we're not gonna be talking about in two weeks? Is that? I'm, we'll find out tomorrow, Janet, honestly. I, I think there's gonna be a big discussion about work plan ahead. And I feel like us guessing at it right now is not really worthwhile. But yeah, I, I think that we're, and, we'll really get into it tomorrow night. Um, with the joint meeting of the CR, uh, town, uh, yeah, CRC. That's exactly why it's a joint meeting, I think. Maybe Jack knows, but, um, but yeah, I, I see item C is discuss next steps on approach to research, analysis, of impacts, drafting, zoning. So it's exactly what you're talking about, Janet. And, um, I think, you know. I actually didn't see the agenda until. So I, I feel like we, I, I honestly want to table that just because tomorrow is going to really describe the path ahead. I just feel like, oh, I don't know, Chris, does that make sense? Or do you think it's worth us? Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Um, there are some more people out in the audience that- Yeah, so you know, I wanna make sure we hit number four, which was, oh, the topic's not reasonably anticipated. You're, oh. 
What was that again? That was something Janet wanted to discuss and it's worth discussing. Um, so we have this new, I guess it's a budget bill that was just passed, but it has a lot oh. of zoning attached to it um, because the governor is very interested in creating more housing. So um, one of the things the new bill contains is um, an easier um, mechanism for adopting zoning regulations that um, allow a town to increase the number of house, houses or dwelling units in town. So it um, reduces the, the, the required vote from uh, two thirds down to um, a majority for certain types of zoning amendments. And most of them have to do with housing. And then the other thing it does is it reduces the um, required vote uh, to approve a special permit for um, projects that have to do with housing. Um, so we have to figure out, we've gotten, a, we've gotten the whole package, which mm -hmm. I haven't read yet. And then we've gotten a memo from KP Law, who is our attorney, um, describing, sort of giving us a summary of what they think is in the bill. And more will come out about this. And I'm sure that the state will be holding seminars about you know exactly what does this mean and how do you fit it into your zoning bylaw but um we need to know about it and we need to figure out are we going to need to make any changes and um we're not sure about that yet we have to have more internal discussions and we probably need to speak with joel bard at some point or one of his um partners uh and get advice from them but for now you know we think you should know about this Mm -hmm. And um, it may it may make some of these things easier to pass through the town council if they have to do with increasing the number of dwelling units in town. So that's about all I have to say about it. And I wonder if Rob wanted to say anything more about it. No, I think that covers it well. Okay. All right, so we'll hear more about that topic, um, I'm sure, as it gets developed. Um, I want to leave the last 10 minutes of our meeting for public comment because um, I don't want everyone to leave and then it's just me and Chris listening. <laughs> so um, <laughs> let me make sure we get to these people. There's um, Pam, you still have your hand out. I don't know if that was from earlier, but we have Dorothy, Pam, Moore, and Hilda who want to speak. And uh, if you just each keep it to three minutes, we can get to dinner by 6.30. So um, Pam, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll put you at the end because you've already spoken, but if you do wanna speak, I'll, you'll be last, but I'm sorry, I did not see who raised their hand first. So I'm just gonna go down the list. So Dorothy, Pam, you wanna, let's see, unmute. Okay, I'm gonna, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, Tom asked what is at stake here and um, I think that one of the issues is, are we trying to create more units of housing or are we trying to create affordable housing? Because the two at this moment in the district, and I, I live in the district you're talking about, okay? My house is on your map. Um, that's the issue here. Um, new housing, what has been happening uh, is that uh, speculators or developers, whatever you wanna call them, have bought up and continue to buy up single family houses and then turn them into multiple student rentals where they can make a lot more money. And therefore the prices of the houses are going up. They're, you know, no matter what the prices of in this, uh, the RG at least, um, Amity, Sunset, Lincoln, whatever, they're going up. And um, so people say, we well, don't have affordable housing. Um, that's because of the competition. If you wanna have affordable more housing, then I don't understand where the discussion of, of um, if you're talking about larger units, inclusionary zoning is going. Um, just never assume, but some people keep assuming more apartments means affordable housing. That's not what's been going on in this district. And the whole rental registration law was put in to stop the actual you know, block busting that was going on. And uh, Maria asked, it wouldn't it, why would a developer buy a bunch of single family homes? Well. That's been happening right now in the last month at the north end of Sunset. Um, a, a very good developer, Barry Roberts, has bought two single family homes. One has been had students in them. The other was a single family home, but they're, they're built single family homes and has been buying up houses on Fearing. I have not talked directly to him, 
but I heard through a second party that he was thinking of perhaps doing condos, which is something that many people have said there was an interest in, but it's coming into the residential neighborhood. So there is, um, because we have a limited space, there's going to be some conflicts going on. And I, I think that it's just, you should not have an assumption that more housing means more affordable housing. Um, I was really interested in learning from Rob about the sprinkler limit. And I forgot, what was the number of units that trigger the sprinkler? Um, I live next door to a very large house, corner of Lincoln and Amity, which may have 16 students in it. And it's had one fire and it had another small thing, but it has a sprinkler system. And so nothing terrible happened. Um, and um, you know, I, I think sprinkler systems, when you have a lot of people, is very important. But why do you want more lot when you add units? Well, perhaps a building has a shadow. The higher the building is, the more shadow it casts. So you may want to have more land around it. And the house on the corner has a lot of land around it. So I have been living very peacefully next to that dwelling and have not been bothered by the fact that, there's, it, that it's very dense there. The people in Lincoln have the view of the 20 cars that are parked there. They're not so happy. Um, so those are just a couple of comments uh, for Tom, who may be not as familiar with this neighborhood um, as I am right now. Okay, thanks, Dorothy. Uh, Maura, who's next on the list here. Did I unmute you? Or can you unmute yourself? There. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was curious about what happened at the last meeting. At the end, there was some talk of changing the zoning in the BL to something similar to the BN. And is that, are we gonna ever come back to that? Or is that something that needs to be brought to the CRC or where, where does that stand now? I can answer that. Okay, go for it. So staff is continuing to work on that, um, <clears throat> on that change um, with Rob Mora and um, we'll be coming up with something and we'll be presenting it to, um, we'll be presenting it to the CRC sometime in March probably, but we're continuing to work on it and we'll be giving reports on what we're working on uh, as time goes on. Great. Is that the only question you had, Maura? Oh, I had one other question about uh, the, I thought, before that, um, that supportive housing unit was built, you know, 132 Northampton, before that was brought up, that the regulation that an apartment building, 50% of the units couldn't be of the same size. I thought that was tossed out by, or voted down by town meeting. It's only and when it's the Spring Street unit would, you know, that's got only one in studio and one bedroom. So that would have to have, that wouldn't fit under the, that zoning if it still existed. There is a zoning bylaw that says if you have a building that's 100% affordable, that you don't need to comply with the um, requirement that, that half of the units um, can't be of any one size or more than half of the units. So in other words, the building at 132 Northampton Road is 100% affordable and it does not need to um, have 50% of its units as some other size units. What about Spring Street or the one that um, Amir is, wants to build? That's all one bedrooms, right? Spring Street is different. It's uh, different. Um, well, Spring Street is a mixed use building and it doesn't have that requirement okay. for sizes of units and Amir's building is also a mixed oh. use building and there's no requirement for um, a mix of unit sizes for that building either. Right. Okay, is that it, Maura? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Hilda? I just have two very quick comments to make. And one is that when those footnotes were put in back in the 80s, um, basically we were having a lot of very fast development that was coming in by Gates and Johnson representing outside interest AJ Lane and, and came in and proposed the Amity Street condos, the Salem Street condos. Um, 
And when they came in with their projects, and also I like to point out the, um, the Mill Valley Estates, which was affordable housing, came in asking for the maximum number of units that would fit on a parcel. And for example, at, I do know that at the Mill Valley Affordable Estate, um, they had 34 acres of which 22 were upland and they came in asking for 208 units and after a lot of negotiation and appeals to the housing committee in Boston, they now have 134. The zoning board of appeals cut them to 78. And that was the mentality then. People came in with a, a the maximum they could put on a parcel and they immediately got caught. I had room for 13 units on North Whitney Street in a parking lot and I could cut to eight. That's the way it was. And and the 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 Crow Hill neighborhood, which is Spruce Hill at High Street, when that project came in, they got really up in arms and, and the whole neighborhood got organized, and that's when the four four thousand feet got put in. And the other thing I wanted to say, getting back to the House Bill 5250, the thing that intrigued me most about that was the ability to have affordable cluster owner occupied starter housing. And I really see in this town that varies between 50 and 60% rental. And I don't know what the number is gonna come out after all this new building in the 2020 census. I don't know how it's, how it's gonna ratio of rental to affordable, but it's been overwhelmingly rental units with, you know, the home occupied, owner occupied people being the smaller part of the group and the ones that are paying the highest taxes, I think. But in any event, um, I really think the lack in this town is middle income starter housing and workforce housing that people can own and get a foot in the door and stop right. building equity. Me too. So me too. that's what I've been pushing for. I don't me, know who said me too, but but I, I think that's really what the need is, is, is owner occupied starter housing. And I'm very intrigued by that part of the, the law, which I've sent to various people. And you don't have to go to 40R, you can do it under 40A. Great, thanks Elda. All right, Pam, so it sounds like, looks like you did have something more to say. Let me unmute. Okay. Uh, yep, yep, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to make a comment more about uh, the density of uh, some of these properties that I looked at, Tanbrook condos, Spruce Ridge condos, and Salem Place condos. Um, and I think when I was, when I was thinking about the 4,000 square feet uh, sort of requirement for additional unit, units, I, I applied the footnote M um, formula to those properties that were developed before footnote M came into being, but I wanted to see where they fell out. And my, my math showed me on three or four different places, oh, also Village Park, uh, up on East Pleasant Street, it, it averages out around 10, 10 dwelling units per uh, acre. And if we were to talk about, in, in fact, enact uh, the elimination of footnote M, then maybe there's also a, an opportunity to insert some, some other mechanism that really says in the RG district, the scale and density of uh, Spruce Ridge, Tan Brook, Salem Place, Village Park is is decent. It's uh, it fosters community. It's a scale that that still is in context with the neighborhood, and it is roughly ten units per acre. So maybe that maybe that um, and I don't want to call it a cap, but maybe that designation is really something that we want to that we want to play around with. Maybe that's more important than the 4,000 square feet per dwelling unit. Um, when I did the the footnote M math, 
uh, I think you, you actually would lose a couple of units, anywhere from 10 to 25% of the units would have fallen away with footnote M. So if people are comfortable with the 10 per acre, maybe that's a target that we should be using instead. Um, the, other, the other last comment about footnote M, it still feels really important as we try to address all of these affordability issues that relaxing the need to um, mandate a distribution of unit sizes or unit types still still feels really important to me that I, I, I really don't think the, the town benefits with you know full buildings of, of studio apartments it doesn't it doesn't push us in the right direction anyway that's it thanks can I butt in before you hang up that you gotta uh, fix you got to fix the um, the mixed use building bylaw. That that's the one that really needs yeah, fixing before that. anything. And then I also want to say, Tambrook was built before Footnote M. Okay. Tambrook was cut way back from what they had asked for too. I forget how many units would have fit on that parcel, but this is smaller. That was back in, in the eighties. All right, thank you everyone for your comments. I'm glad that uh, Rob and Chris can, were here to hear that and transfer it to the, the rest of the planning department because in our work ahead, yeah, all of these um, sort of various inputs from various people were really useful. Um, so next meeting, um, we shall see. <laughs> and then um, I think, yeah, tomorrow at the joint meeting between plan board and CRC, we'll, we'll know what our path ahead is and um, go from there. So, all right, adjournment. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bye -bye. Thank you Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. See you guys. Bye. Bye.